Angels, it's Haley Reese and for today's video I am joined by a very special guest and that is the real Annabelle doll from the previous Annabelle film but also from the upcoming Annabelle film Annabelle Comes Home which releases June 26th to theaters. I will actually have a link down in the description for you guys if you want to purchase your tickets to go and see the film but I figured since I have the privilege and the honor of having the real Annabelle doll here in my home, I would set her up behind me and we would once again go over the story of the real Annabelle doll because I learned some new details about the story since the last time I made a video on it and I figured why not share them with you while the real Annabelle doll from the film is sitting here with me. Before I get into today's video though, I would just very quickly like to let you guys know that you guys have the chance to win the opportunity to bring an Annabelle doll to your very own home. So I will have a link down in the description with all of the details and how to enter. Make sure you guys do that and hopefully you will win the opportunity to bring an Annabelle doll into your home. So before I get into the story, I just want to clarify and let you guys know exactly where this doll came from and what exactly this doll is. The doll sitting here was created by James Wan for the Annabelle films and this is the exact doll that plays Annabelle in the Annabelle movies. Now the original Annabelle that she is based off of was actually a Raggedy Ann doll and that's the doll that we're going to be talking about today. But I really want to let you guys know why this doll is so eerie to me and that is in a lot of the cases that I've researched in the past where it's based on a true story and has to do with any sort of like demonic possession or any sort of possessed doll or anything of those sorts, a lot of cast members will say that the set actually felt haunted and it felt as though there was a presence around on the set. Now, while I haven't heard that personally from the Annabelle film, it's really eerie and interesting to think about the fact of what this doll is based on, what this doll is depicting in the film and what this doll represents. So I'm going to set her up behind me and we are going to dive into once again the story of Annabelle with some added details that I recently learned at the Warren Occult Museum that are just absolutely chilling. All right, let me set her up. So for those of you who don't know, I recently had an opportunity thanks to Warner Brothers to go out to Connecticut and head to the Warren Occult Museum. I got to hear the stories of all of the artifacts in the museum straight from Ed and Lorraine Warren's son-in-law, Tony, who is the husband of their daughter, Judy Warren. And I got to hear more details as far as the real Annabelle went. And I actually had the privilege and honor to meet the real Annabelle. This is the real Annabelle, guys. So in 1970, a Raggedy Ann doll was purchased from a hobby store for a woman by the name of Donna for her 28th birthday. Now the doll was actually purchased from her mother who at the time believed that it was nothing more than a regular Raggedy Ann doll. And Donna was somebody who'd always loved dolls. She had this passion for collecting them. So her mom thought that when she saw this doll in the hobby store, it would be the perfect 28th birthday present for her daughter, Donna. Now Donna was actually a nurse and lived with her roommate, Angie, who was also a nurse. And initially when Donna received the doll, she loved it. She loved it so much that she took such great care of it and both Donna and Angie believed this was just a regular Raggedy Ann doll. Interestingly enough, things didn't start out so crazy with the doll. It was very gradual how things began happening. Slowly but surely there would be odd incidences where they'd recognize the doll appeared to have moved. At first they noticed that like limbs on the doll were moving in ways that it probably shouldn't on its own. The doll's legs were crossing, the doll would be seen leaning on her arm, and the doll would move into strange positions that most Raggedy Ann dolls definitely did not. Sometimes the doll would even be seen standing up. And so they started to wonder if something strange really was going on with the doll or if someone was playing tricks on them. The girls kind of started to test the doll. They would specifically put it in one place with its limbs in one specific like position, and then they would leave the doll alone, only to come back and notice that the doll was moving in very strange position. In one really strange instance, Donna brought the doll with her to the breakfast nook and had the doll sitting in a chair, like I don't know if it was across from her, but it was sitting in a chair with her at the breakfast nook. Donna began kind of talking to the doll and just like 
going about her regular business when she saw the doll's arms levitate up and rest on the table. It was around this time that something even creepier started happening too, and that was they began finding notes throughout the home on parchment paper when they didn't even own parchment paper. And in fact, it was written in crayon, but the girls didn't even own crayons. The notes would say things like, help us, help me, help Lou. And they were just really eerie notes. But once again, like I told you guys, they were written on paper and with writing utensils that the girls didn't own. Now, if you're wondering who Lou was, Lou was a really close friend of both Donna and Angie, and Lou never liked this doll right from the get-go. He had a really bad feeling about it. He just really didn't like the doll. Now, at this point in time, the girls began wondering if someone was breaking in, like perhaps their landlord or someone that they knew was playing tricks on them, because how would this parchment paper be appearing? Why would the doll be moving from room to room? Like, what was going on with this doll? So they actually started to like try to trap the person who was doing this to them. They would like barricade the door in and try all of these different means to like protect anybody from being able to go inside. And when they would return, none of that would be amiss, but the doll would still have moved. When Donna came home one day, she found on the doll's hands what appeared to look like blood. And it was at this point that the girls decided that maybe there was something paranormal going on with the doll. At this point, Angie actually said that she knew of a psychic and thought it'd be a great idea to have some sort of a seance with the psychic, the girls, and the doll to see what's going on with the doll and if perhaps the doll may be haunted. The psychic came in, the girls had the seance, and the psychic went into like this trance. And it was at this point in time that the psychic began to tell them that their doll was occupied by a little girl spirit by the name of Annabelle Higgins, who was around six or seven years old. Now it was said that Annabelle Higgins had passed away on the property prior to the building that the girls were living in even being built and that that was a place of happiness for her. She had a lot of fond memories there and she really just wanted to stay there, but that she'd taken a liking to the doll. So she thought that by inhabiting the doll, she could continue to live where she loved to live and be within this doll that she loved. This spirit, Annabelle, continued to tell the girls that she had no ill intent towards them, she apologized if she scared them, and basically, in summary, convinced the girls to let her stay. But that was no little girl spirit inside of her. So the girls decided that they would allow Annabelle, the spirit, to live within the doll, to live within their home. But their friend Lou still really didn't like Annabelle, and he was actually the first to have a demonic encounter with the doll. Now, Lou was actually sleeping at the girl's house when he fell into a state of sleep paralysis. And I'm sure you know what sleep paralysis is, but I will tell you in summary, sleep paralysis is essentially where your mind is coherent and awake, but your body is still asleep and you are unable to physically move. Now, he said that he was falling into this state of sleep paralysis and nothing seemed to miss until all of a sudden that raggedy ant doll appeared at the end of the bed and began crying crawling towards him, which could you even imagine a Raggedy Ann doll crawling towards you? The doll crawled and crawled and crawled, and when the doll got up to him, it began choking and strangling him. He felt suffocated, he couldn't breathe, and he just felt evil coming out of this doll as it was choking him. During this state of sleep paralysis, he actually passed out from being choked. When he awoke, he was super alarmed by the experience and still had, now even more so, this horrible feeling about the doll. A little bit later, Lou and Angie had an experience where they heard a loud crash in one of the rooms. When they went into the room, Annabelle was sitting in the center of the room. And Lou, at this point, had kind of just like had it. He had told them about the experience that he had with the doll, feeling like it was demonic. Now the doll's making these noises, so he picks up the doll and says, it's just a Raggedy Ann doll, it can't hurt anybody, and he throws the doll across the room. I really think that he was trying to probably convince himself at this point in time, like, that this was just a Raggedy Ann doll, that his experiences weren't valid, that he was just paranoid because he really didn't like the doll, and the girl said that there was some ghost in it. So he threw the doll across the room. It was at this point in time that seven psychic wounds appeared on Lou's body. He had four wounds that were like scratch marks across his chest and three wounds across his stomach. And they were like so deep that they actually began bleeding through his shirt. It looked as though like some claws had just like attacked him. It was at this point in time that they knew for certain that there was no possible way 
that that was the spirit of a six or seven year old little girl. There was no possible way that by him throwing that, the spirit of a six or seven year old girl who loved to live there would cause seven wounds across him like claw marks. So the girls didn't know what to do, but they knew that this was not something that they should be taking lightly and they knew that they needed help. So it was at this point in time that the girls called in a priest. And the priest came in and he really didn't know what to do. In fact, he actually told the girls that they needed to call Ed Warren as he knew about that paranormal stuff. So Father Nolan suggests that the girls call Ed Warren and Ed Warren goes to the house with Lorraine. They realize at this point in time that it was a demonic spirit within the doll that tried to disguise and mask itself as a little girl, but it was pure evil and that it wanted someone to possess. Ed and Lorraine Warren did everything that they could there, but the girls did not want anything more to do with the doll and Ed said that the doll was not safe there and that they would take it back to their occult museum. Now when they first brought the doll back to the occult museum, they actually had it in a chair and they had like a rope around the chair, but it wasn't in its protective casing that we've all come to know now. Now this was still during the 70s and at this point in time, a lot of priests had heard about this demonic doll that was able to put psychic wounds on people. And a lot of priests came to check out the doll. One priest in particular came over to the warden's house to show them his new car. Lorraine made him tea, he stayed for lunch, and then he asked Ed if he could see the doll that put these psychic wounds on people. So Ed said yes and brought him down to the museum. And when they got down to the museum, Ed started showing him all the different artifacts and telling him about everything. And then they reached the doll. Ed started telling the priest about this doll. And when he got to the part of the psychic wounds, the priest picked up the doll and said, God is more powerful than any devil or demon and threw the doll similar to how Lou had. Now immediately Ed was like, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. But he wasn't too phased by it and stood true to his word at that time. And he got in his car and he left. But Lorraine Warren was urging him to be careful because that wasn't a force to be messed with. The priest never made it back safely. In fact, he got into a very severe car accident where he lost control and went head on into a tractor trailer. Now he survived the accident, but it said that this was like a warning to the priest. And shortly after his accident, the priest called up Ed distraught and said, Ed, you were right. I never should have done that. I never should have touched that doll. I never should have taunted that doll. The last thing he remembered before the accident was looking in his mirror and seeing the face of the doll when he lost control and crashed his car. And he told Ed, you know, Ed, I don't understand. God is more powerful than any devil or demon. And Ed told him, yeah, God is, but no human is. You should have never taunted that doll. And that just gives me chills whenever I think of that. That's actually something that Tony shared with us when we were in the Warren Occult Museum. So that's new information to me and it just gives me chills to think about. Now there was another incident where somebody provoked and taunted Annabelle and that was a 20-ish year old male who went into the museum with his girlfriend. Now similar to the first story, when Ed was sharing the story of Annabelle, when he got to the part about the, the lacerations, the cuts that were put on Lou, he went ahead and taunted the doll. He banged on the glass and said, if that doll could put marks on anyone, put them on me right now. Ed looked at him and said, I told you not to do that. I told you not to touch anything. I told you not to taunt anything. You need to leave. And he and his girlfriend left very smugly. Well, they went there on a motorcycle and they got on their motorcycle to leave. And unfortunately, after he left, he died. Approximately three hours after leaving the museum, he and his girlfriend were riding on the motorcycle laughing about the doll when he lost complete control crashed his motorcycle and died. And the reason that they know that story is because the girlfriend survived, although she was in the hospital for over a year, according to Tony. And she said that the last thing that they did before the accident was taunt the doll. And then he crashed into a tree and unfortunately and sadly met his death. Now, even Tony says, you can't say for certain whether or not that was due to Annabelle or whether or not he just crashed his motorcycle. But regardless, it's been proven that Annabelle is incredibly dangerous and that it's important to keep her within that case. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen the video yet, but you will see the video where um, during my tour of the Warren Occult Museum, they let us know how the case that she was in was, was made. And it's just so holy and so godly. And it's just crazy that that doesn't even just solely do the trick. It needs to be blessed weekly. Annabelle is perhaps the most dangerous doll in the entire world. And when they were asked as to why they didn't just destroy the doll, 
Tony had a phenomenal answer, and that was that destroying the doll would just release the demon back into the world. When it's in the doll, they're able to contain it and keep it safe and secured in their museum. Now, I will say to you guys, I met Annabelle, like I told you guys earlier, and something about that doll just makes you think that she's sweet and she's innocent. And I, if I didn't know the story, would probably believe that, that a six or seven year old girl was in it. She has this face that looks so kind and warm and welcoming. But after you know that it's a demon inside of her, you know how deceitful that Raggedy Ann smile is. And I think that's what makes it all the more creepy. Well, this Annabelle here is creepy to the looks. Imagine a Raggedy Ann doll climbing on top of you and strangling you. It just doesn't sit very well. So that is, once again, the story of Annabelle. The history of the doll, how she wound up kept in that protective case, and how she inspired the creation of this Annabelle right here, and the upcoming Annabelle Comes Home in theaters June 26th. Like I said, you guys have a chance to win the opportunity to have an Annabelle doll come to your home. So if you're interested in that, the link will be down in the description. All of the contest details and how to enter will be down there as well. But that is the story of the real Annabelle. What do you guys think of Annabelle? I want to know in the comments below, do you think that this Annabelle is creepier? Or do you think that the Raggedy Ann Annabelle is creepier? Let me know in the comments below. I hope that you guys enjoyed today's story time with our special guest. I hope that you enjoyed hearing some of the new details. And I hope that you guys go and see Annabelle Comes Home because I've seen it and whoo, you don't want to miss it. If you guys are new to my channel or you are just not yet subscribed but you do enjoy my videos, make sure you go ahead and click that subscribe button. And please give this video a big thumbs up if you did enjoy it. Thank you so much Warner Brothers for the opportunity of a lifetime. I've had so much fun spending time with this Annabelle right here and I'm so appreciative that you guys selected me for this. Remember my loves, do all things with kindness and until next time, I love you guys.